Welcome back, WNST, Taos of Baltimore and Baltimore Positive, all of our programming here brought to you by all of our partners, including our friends at Liberty Pure Solutions. Uh, you know, you need fresh water, you need clean water, well water, you need a water heater. Our friends at Liberty Pure take care of those things. Doug Workman's there standing by to provide those water solutions for you. Also, our friends at Blondell Miller Schuler. Had Todd Schuler on earlier this week. We talked a little Constitution. Uh, also talked about, uh, you know, president-elects and more than that, gratitude during the holidays. And next week we're going to argue about pumpkin pie and sweet potato pie and pecan pie. <laughs> we'll get all of that in. The guy laughing in the background uh, was uh, you know, a guy that I cheered for uh, back in the day. I was a Houston Oilers, Houston Oilers. So when I get a chance to have an old Aller on, I always take the opportunity to do that. This is a fun week for me. We play the Tennessee Titans to go back to my Oiler fandom and all the media people and friends to all the years. Blaine Bishop has become one of those guys. I met Blaine Bishop back before we had a National Football League team here. He was the Houston Oilers representative for the Ed Block Courage Awards back in the 1990s. Yeah. Uh, I got to meet Blaine uh, downtown, tell some jokes, have some fun. Uh, and I think I have old pictures of you and me in your all our gear the day we said goodbye to 33rd Street Memorial Stadium. Blaine, how are you, man? How's life down here in Tennessee? You wash your hands, uh, breathing through a mask, staying safe? Oh, yeah, definitely that. We, we're doing all of our shows uh, remotely like uh, pretty much everybody else. But I want to know if you found that picture of me just walking around in my oily uniform downtown. <laughs> did you do that no i did not <laughs> and look man i saw that jersey over your shoulder and i said it looked like a 49ers jersey for me and i looked at it i'm like it's red it's red. and then i saw the oiler Derek up on the shoulder up there yeah. and i realized that's your pro ball jersey and, oh yeah yeah i got some things up there i didn't even think about that oh yet. look at that well that's that's titans up there i don't i don't see that we, we yeah, i titans, wash that away we uh, you know, that whole Eddie George there, we wash that whole thing away. Hey, man, you know, for your team and our team and all these years, I do see that thing up behind you. It's kind of a hell of a history between the Titans and the Ravens. And more than that, the fact that you smacked us in the mouth here eight months, nine, nine months ago, really, really wrecked oh. a pretty good thing we had going on. Yeah, man, that, that was a little surprising by all, but uh... – you know, uh, they got on a run uh, there with, with King Henry and, and Tannehill. Those guys got hot. And they were able to run the football. But defensively, Dean Pease, I think a former employee of you guys too as well, came up with a great game plan to slow down Jackson and crew. And it was pretty impressive, uh, actually, to see it happen. I was one of the few people thought uh, they could do the, uh, the upset. I thought they were hot. And uh, spoiler uh, you know, big time spoiler on the road, uh, backs against the wall. And I, I think everybody overlooked the Titans. I thought that was another point that's a, that's an edge, uh, in that game, but now the tide has turned, I think. And I think, you know, uh, the Ravens are going to be pissed off because they let one slip by that they thought was, which was a, in a phenomenal team. And, uh, they're going to be pissed. And not only that, they lost just this previous week. So the Titans are going to have to give them best. So hopefully a little bit of time off, Playing on Thursday and then uh, having a longer week, couple days off, a mini bye helps out. But it's going to be an interesting one here, man. I, I think the Ravens are going to be so pissed off that uh, they're going to try to hammer the Titans. Man, we're hurting right now. I mean, the, the, the loss of Marshall Yonda, then Ronnie Stanley, now Nick Boyle. This is a different football team than even the one that, uh, you know, that they were preparing for back in January and Dean Pease and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I would say for me, I, I look at this team and say, last year's 14-2. and two, We all expected something more than 14-2. and two. That's sort of absurd, right? Like, once you're 14-2 and two and your freight training team's 45-6, to six, that other teams have drafted for this. Cincinnati, everybody I talked to in Cincinnati said they, they were embarrassed by Lamar Jackson last year. Yeah. And look at what the Steelers have done in this division at undefeated right now. You know, no matter how good you are, there's an answer. And, play. we talk about Derrick Henry. I, when I think about him, my wife was ill back in 2014 and 15, and she was in the hospital for long stretches. And I remember being in the hospital every Saturday during that fall and watching Derrick Henry just run over guys. And guys like you, safeties, you know, big, strong, tough guys <laughs> that looked like they didn't want any part of him, you know, back in college. <laughs> and I thought he's going to be a hell of an NFL player, sort of in that Earl Campbell or Jamal Lewis sort of way. That's not the way the game is structured. I, I sort of – I was not shocked that he ran over people at the NFL level, but I was sort of shocked that, that other teams didn't want a guy like him earlier in the draft. 
Yeah, that was a little surprising. And, and I think it was because, not, not because he wouldn't go to big school and he did a great job. We all know won the Heisman and played really well in Alabama. I think when he went to the combine, they saw, and I think this is what the Titans, they said, well, we can't pass him up past the second round. That's, there's no way. I mean, they took him in the early parts of the second round. Is that his lateral quickness uh, wasn't a high number. It was more mid to lower part of the rest of the running backs. And to be honest, when he got here, I think that's why the slow start, besides we had DeMarco Murray, is that uh, he had to work on his lateral quickness. And when that comes into play is when you get penetration in the line of scrimmage, you have to jump cut and make cuts. And he wasn't real good at that because he has the long leg. He's a long strider. He's a build-up power speed guy. And so if you got to him early, he was ineffective. And he's worked on it tremendously uh, to be a better back, uh, not just that, but also all around back. So he's worked on his catching out of the backfield. Uh, so he's become an all around back. And I I'm impressed uh, that uh, he's come this far and had so much success because when he first got here, there were some doubts if he could ever be the guy. And after he had a conversation with Eddie George for whatever that's worth, I don't know what was said, but he had a conversation that you got to just pound people and pound people. I guess, until they, you break their will and then you'll break one instead of looking for that home run hit all the time. You know, Blaine, we've talked uh, over the years. I mean, there was a period where the Titans felt like a, a franchise adrift, right? Like at the end, the death of the owner and the daughter takes over and there's different coaches and some power struggles and not good drafts and you, 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 all of that, right? Mm -hmm. This feels like as stable as it's been and more than that, and we talk about Ryan Tannehill and guys getting second chances and it not working out in various places and all of these quarterbacks, we talk about them for three months, you know, all of February, all of March, all of April. They're all the savior. They all can't be the savior. But right. then, the, then something clicks somewhere. And, and the one thing, I, Marvin Lewis always sits in the back of my mind saying, we all get smarter. We don't get dumber. We learn more. And in this case for Tannehill, I, uh, a, a bit of a disrespected guy as he got brought in there uh, at the end of Marcus Mariota, right? Yeah, you know, they traded for him and everybody uh, there in Miami acted as though, you know, he was he horrible, uh, you know, and that, uh, you know, I thought it was more the connection with him and the, the coach uh, and the offensive coordinator. Uh, we all know he's at the Jets right now. And uh, because when he first got here, there was no question when they got to training camp with him and Marcus Mariota, Mariota was the starter, that he was better than Mariota just on visual look. And when I say that, I'm talking about making accurate throws, bigger arm, uh, had a, you know, he went downtown at practice, but he waited his turn until Marcus faltered and then they gave him a shot. And the team totally changed after that. And I think a lot of it had to do, he had learned a lot sitting there on the sideline and, you know, he was holding on to the ball a little long and then he would let it go late. Boom. And then it, it, it happened almost every single time he was taking shots. He would maneuver in the pocket, much better uh, feel for the pocket than Marcus uh, did. And uh, he was more than just an athlete at quarterback. Because the guy did start a wide receiver at Texas A&M. People must not forget. This guy's a pretty good athlete. And uh, he's shown that he's a leader. And I think there's a lot of things that he learned throughout that process in Miami, which when you look over his numbers, he had a pretty good, you know, clip there. Uh, you know, he threw for three, four thousand. I mean, he, you know, he was putting up numbers. Uh, I just think it was a lot of things that just like here changed in ownership uh, with the daughter taking over and the passing of, of Bud Adams. And it feels like a new organization here. And they rolled the dice with John Robinson, we call him JR, the general manager, uh, rolled the dice and traded for him and said, hey, you're going to come in as our backup and you're going to be uh, our security blanket. And he became more than that. And he became their franchise quarterback. And, uh, you know, I, I think when he played the Ravens, everybody thought he wasn't, you know, very good. But what the Titans did was in that game is once they showed that they could run the football, they said, why throw it? Because Tannehill all season shown that he was a competent passer and was putting up 20, 25 passes a game and was very accurate throughout that whole time. Uh, a little different now in that lost Lawan, so he's taking some more shots. So I'm interested to see how he continues to progress because he's kind of hitting a little snag here with the pressure. And then uh, now he's overthrowing, he's rushing throws a little bit. And that can happen when you don't have protection.
Blaine Bishop is here. You can follow him out on Twitter. He is a four-time Pro Bowler. Only that Oiler one up there. One of four, five, the zone, as well as Blaine. Uh, excuse me, B Bishop two three. B Bishop two three. The way to follow him out on Twitter down there in Nashville. Uh, for the pandemic and the Titans being the first team flogged in the NFL, and now you know the Browns are on their second week and not having Zoom meetings this week and whatnot. Uh, from your player perspective and what you've seen and being around this, and obviously none of us have access to the players or the bubble. You've been out on the Cumberland River as a player many moons ago to, to what they're going through. This is the strangest season. And then you, you add on injuries and you talked about Lawan there. We talked about Ronnie Stanley here and uh, what's happened to Nick Boyle here over the week. And uh, you know, I, I wonder the attrition part of this and I'm very worried about the league watching baseball, hockey, basketball. They completed the Masters over the weekend. Football's got to get to the finish line. I'm deeply concerned about COVID in the country and football players. And you know, one of the reasons I didn't fly to Indy last week and didn't fly to New England is I feel like I might fly there and they might not have the game. Um, and it hasn't been any fun to be in these empty stadiums. So I've abstained. You know, I mean, I'm not going to the games. I'm watching them on TV for the first time in my life. But from a player perspective for you, putting your mind into, oh, my God, if this would have happened in 98 when I was playing, what would that have been like? <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that's kind of interesting you say that because nobody's ever dealt with anything like this. And I thought it was a lot of hesitation by the players and, and as well as the coaches and organizations in the beginning. A lot of uh, players were conflicted, especially if, uh, you know, they're the head of the household and they're afraid that, you know, no one knew if you could catch it by plane or not and you take it back to, let's say, your mother or grandmother or, or family. Well, my wife's diabetic and a two-time cancer survivor. I can't come off a plane with COVID, you know, bring it home. Yeah, with all the unknowns, I think a lot of guys were very nervous in the beginning. And uh, I thought it was going to be a wave of a lot of opt-outs. It uh, wasn't as much as I thought it would be. Uh, I think as time went on, they watched some of the players play and they go, OK, so they seems like they can manage through and play in games. And naturally, you're going to have some outbreaks here or there, uh, which every team now is having. The Titans were one of the first teams, if not the first. And it's, you know, it's a pandemic. What can you do uh, besides protect yourself uh, as much as you can? And that doesn't mean you won't still uh, test positive. So I, I think the NFL has actually done a really good job. You have to get to the finish line. I think it's something interesting, though, when you start getting closer and closer to the end and if you start having a lot of breakouts, would you then go to this bubble model at each, uh, you know, professional team and have them, let's stay in a hotel, like right by the facility or somewhere there about, and then that way you don't have any outbreaks. You make sure uh, that the games are finished or played even uh, when you get in the playoffs. So it'll be interesting to see where we go from here. If there's a lot of outbreaks towards the end of the season, what the league will do to kind of address it. I don't know if they'll do anything, but that's something probably to consider. Fly them all to Vegas and put them in one hotel. I haven't played, you know I mean? They've got stadiums well, no, I was in talking about now. just in each state. I was just saying in each state kind of bubble. I just think up. once, you, you know, Vegas, Buffalo's okay. here and Kansas City's there and the Ravens are there, if it's January 8th and Lamar Jackson and three players can't post on Sunday – you know, you don't really have a real tournament, you know, and, and like that, that's, that's the issue for me. And, and to say, well, it's just like an injury. No, it's not. It's contagious, you, you know, and, and now that we're going back into this, I, I would hate for the NFL to have to stop in the middle of all of this, the way society is going to have to stop apparently based right. on this being a virus and all the things that mattered last March still matter this December. Blake Bishop is here. I, you know, I want to talk a little bit of, of football from your eyes looking at Lamar Jackson on the other side. Since last time you and I got together, I remember telling you the story. Eric Weddle in, the, in that ramp at the uh, L.A. Memorial Coliseum last year after those purple and gold jersey night when they got freight trained, Weddle said, you know, I practiced against that for a year. I told everybody all week the things and the keys and everything we're supposed to look for. And the one thing I didn't account for is nobody knew who had the ball. That, you know, <laughs> that literally he said, we never knew who had the ball. And he's passed you before you know he has the ball. And the sleight of hand and Lamar, and we're not seeing that work as much this year we're seeing life is different when you don't have Marshall Yonda over here and Ronnie Stanley over there um 
the, the weapons are different in the offense, what the Ravens want to do. It feels like they want to pass the ball, and that's not what they do well. And it feels like every Blaine Bishop and every, you know, safety out there, they're putting six of them out there, you know, athletes that can run like you could. And it's a whole different way that they're going about this. And part of that was born out of what the Titans did in January. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of us going on. Across the league, though, everybody's making adjustments. And I think the key now, not only after losing some players with the Ravens on the offensive line, is what was going to be your counter move if teams were stacked the decks against you and you couldn't do what you did the year before? Because that's what makes the NFL so special, is that the coaches adapt and change as they go along to say, hey, this, this, that work, and not to give up on it, but not make it the staple all the time. And then come back with it, you know, three or four weeks later. I think that's why they're trying to, you know, they're trying to throw the football. Uh, and I, I think he can potentially Jack, be a really good passer in this league. Uh, I watched him all the time at Louisville uh, play, and, and I thought, uh, you know, that he could, he could throw the football with the best of them. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting to see how he matures in, in, his, in his game. As he goes along, can he continue to grow as a player? We all want to anoint him. He won the MVP and everything else. But at the end of the day, he still has to grow as a player. And that's why every time I listen to him, I love that because I hear that. I hear him saying, I need to get better. I got to continue to work to get better. He's not, you know, one of those guys that, hey, I'm already arrived. So you got the right mindset and uh, work ethic. Uh, so that's always dangerous. So once he gets it and starts hitting everything on point, all cylinders and everything on offense has to, all 11 guys have to work in unison. It's funny because on defense, if somebody messes up, you can cover for them. But on offense, it doesn't work that way. Uh, so uh, you got to all work cohesively uh, as a unit and, uh, and then let alone he has the ball in his hand. So you got to make sure he be pinpoint accurate when he throws the football. Blaine, you, you talk about throwing the football and the, and the want to throw the football. And you say, all right, what are we going to draft to do here? And what kind of offensive line are we going to build? You know, they, they, they had a road grading machine last yeah. year and it was working and that's what they did and when you don't make it on fourth and one against the titans and you kick the ball around and you don't play defense you lose and you get thrown out of the tournament at 14 and two but there's something special about getting to that 14 last year that they're in second and three and second and two all day long that's not the profile of this team and and more than that I don't know that they have the personnel to throw the football. You say, well, can Lamar do it? Uh, okay, so Lamar can do it. Now go protect him. Now go get open. Now right. go run routes. You, you, you know, that now, now block up in front and, and make it so that he doesn't want to run. Um, it feels to me like he's looking to pass a whole lot more than looking to run. And I know that's what we all wished him to do two years ago because <laughs> he's running headlong in the linebackers. We're like, no, please, no contact. But I don't know that this can be truly as effective as they want it to be. Yeah, and that's always a tough battle, especially for the quarterback that has that kind of athletic ability and speed is to be that balanced quarterback. Not only are you a threat running the football, but you also are the, the threat passing the football. I think Russell Wilson has defined the art of being able to do both. He really doesn't want to run, but he is capable. And everybody can see him when he runs for a first down and go, oh, man, he's going to run the football. But his whole identity is, I want to be able to throw the football down the football field. And I think that's where Jackson is right now. He's getting a little conflicted in certain things aren't working in the one game. He really wants to take off, but yet he wants to be defined as I can also throw the football uh, and be accurate continuously, time in, game in and out all the time. And I think that's always a tough battle with a player with his ability you know, I played with McNair, McNabb, uh, and they all had to prove those same things. Well, then there's the guy like you out there running around in, in, in a secondary covering someone, and Lamar sort of takes off or starts to take off. Oh, or, no, or Russell starts to take off. <laughs> you, you know, somebody's got to go chase him down, and, and, and that's when he probably could be effective throwing the football, right? Right. And that's, that's what I said. It's hard to really figure that out, you know, and sometimes it clicks in early for some guys. And then some, it takes a little bit of time. And I think he's in that process of figuring that out. Uh, because then once he turns it on, a guy with his ability, dynamic, explosive runner, uh, you know, uh, with his quicks, I think once he determines I'm running, he's running. He's never saying, oh, let me stop right here and throw this pass. I think he's, he says, I can run and get it done uh, and make it easy for myself. And uh, that's, that's, that's going to be a tough field because one day, I hate to say it, 
he's going to take that shot and go say, dang, I wish – I mean, I'm talking about shot means somebody hits him. Uh, and he's going to say, I wish I hit through the football. I mean, you know, I'm sure RG3 is talking to him about that, right? Uh, I, w- I would hope. And, uh, you know, we all rue the day that he really gets hit. And so far, so good. We're crossing yeah. our fingers and we're 6-3. and three, But he maligned 6-3 and three here as the Tennessee Titans come into Baltimore. Blaine Bishop does a radio down at 104.5 The Zone in Nashville. You can find him out at B Bishop 23 Give me a little holiday story, man. I, I'm trying to open it up here for everybody that comes on. I know everybody has something in their heart for Thanksgiving or Christmas or turkeys. I mean, hell, you played in the league a decade and uh, you did a thousand things out in the community. Yeah. You still live there. You're still a football player, even though you're not anymore. Give me yeah. a little community thought for next week. <laughs> well, uh, I guess uh, everyone be safe, Let's first and foremost, because it is the holidays. You got Thanksgiving, you got Christmas, as well as you got New Year's coming up. Uh, and all the times are kind of going to be adjusted uh, to a little bit different way that you spend that holiday. But make sure it's a giving way uh, that you help someone else out and uh, be thankful for all the, the years that you're, uh, you're here to spend time with your yeah, own. We all have these traditions, though, right? They get like everything's going to get thrown off a little bit. You it do is. a thing with your tree and the community down there in Nashville. And I, you know, I, just, just trying be to homeless. get normal, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, try to be normal, you know, feed the homeless, uh, big brothers, big sisters, uh, Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts of America. I'm a part of all of those programs, and uh, they're all uh, trying to do the, the right thing. But right now, everybody's a little nervous and scared with all these outbreaks, so make sure you just stay safe. Zoom up and inspire them, Blaine. I appreciate you, man. At some point, we'll get together and get some barbecue down on a strip there, all right? Will do, man. Appreciate Anytime. it. Blaine Bishop, he is Thank B. You. Bishop, 2-3. The Hitman, you can find him out there at the 104.5 The Zone as well on Twitter. You can find me at the New Baltimore Positive with all of our sponsors and friends, including Planet Fitness, our friends at Royal Farms, real fresh, real fast. I pumped some gas there yesterday. I'm going to pick up some chicken for the weekend for the game. I'm not going to the game, so I've been sitting at home eating Western fries and chicken on Sundays. Also, our friends at Sport of Culture with the beautiful magma lamp. Maybe, you know, Court was an Oiler fan. Maybe he can get me an Oiler magma lamp. That, that bubbles blue, Columbia blue. Ness at BaltimorePositive.com finds me. Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Snapchat, everywhere you are. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking Baltimore Positive. <laughs>